If you do not have clear, specific goals for your life, don't tell me you wish your life was better because you're lying to me and you're lying to yourself. There are four major obstacles to goal setting. Uh, is the fear of rejection or criticism. Here's the key to goal setting. Don't tell anybody. When you set goals, the only people you discuss your goals with are the people who also have goals, who will encourage you with your goals, and will tell you that your goals are attainable and that you can do it. Now, the second reason that people don't set goals is people don't know how. People think, well, you just write down what you want to do. Well, that's helpful, but it's not enough. The third reason, C, is that people don't realize the importance of goals. If you've been brought up in a family where goals were not constantly emphasized, if you associate with people who don't talk about and work on goals all the time, you can actually drift along not even aware that goals are central to success in life. The last is fear of failure. We very carefully protect ourselves from these feelings of low self-esteem. And how do we do that? We sabotage ourselves unconsciously by not setting goals for ourselves. So, we can't fail. If you don't set goals for yourself, you can't succeed either. So the ability to set goals and to make plans for their accomplishment is the master success. If you master all other skills, this, your life will be diminished to that degree. It just means that your life will be diminished dramatically compared to what it could be. Now, desire. And this is where we start. Desire is the only real limit to your abilities. The only question you ever have to ask is, how badly do you want it? If you want it badly enough, key word for success is hungry. Here are the two keys with regard to desire. Desire. It must be personal. You can't say, I want someone to love me. You cannot set a goal for another person. You want to be in a perfect relationship. So what you do is you describe your perfect relationship. You sit down and you make a list of the perfect person as though you were going to hire someone to run your company. And you make a list of the perfect person and you describe them in detail. Height, weight, size, education, experience, personality, background, temperament, interests, enthusiasm, leisure time, activities, everything. I have given this exercise to countless people when they were single and they've been astonished at how fast they met the perfect person. The very act of crystallizing it by writing it down, by deciding what you want and writing it down, activates this force field of attraction and starts to draw that person into your life. Same with business relationships. B. They must be burning, intense, passionate. In fact, when you are working on your major definite purpose, there's a measure. And you know what it is. You become very impatient with the physical need of having to sleep. It makes you impatient, so you're always structuring your time so that you are sleeping the amount that you need, but only that because you want to get up and get going the next stage. Number two is belief. If you have a belief that you don't deserve success, or if you have a belief, am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Do I deserve success? You're going to have opposing goals and opposing beliefs. So let's say if your goal is to make $100,000, but your belief is that you only deserve to make $50,000, you are going to be out of sync or out of vibration, and they'll basically cancel each other out. Or you'll do a little bit of hard work, and then you'll sabotage your success, or you'll think you can achieve it for a day or two. So belief is absolutely important. If you absolutely important, if you absolutely believe it, you will walk, talk, think, feel, behave, and get results consistent with your beliefs. If you feel confident, you act confident. But if you don't feel confident, act confident. And it will cause you to feel confident. Now, number three, write it down. You pull them out of the air where they have no substance at all, and you write them down on paper. And when you write a goal down, you engage in what is called a psycho neuro motor activity. You activate your visual powers, your audio powers, and your kinesthetic powers. And whatever you write down, only 3% of Americans have written goals. And you know something. Everybody works for them. Everybody works for them. The fourth key is to determine all the reasons why you want the goal. One of the big thrusts for success is to come up with a strong enough why. If the why is powerful, the how is easy. 
You've got to have your own list of reasons if you want to be successful because you have 10 or 15 or 20 or 50 or 100 or 300 things you want to do with your success. You will be like a force of nature. Now, the fifth key is to analyze your starting position. You can't go from rope to buckets of money. You have to demonstrate that you can be a master over small amounts of money. You'll get bigger amounts by uh, a law of attraction. Remember the reality principle? What's the reality? You get on the scales and you weigh yourself and you weigh yourself and you honestly admit, this is where I am. If you want to be fit, you go down and you take a fitness test. Number six, set a deadline. Uh, and as Nian once said that your subconscious can work against you because when you set a big goal, you're disrupting your subconscious. So your subconscious mind will attempt to sabotage you. It tells you, ah, uh, you can't achieve this goal. You don't need to write it down. It's okay as long as you know what it is. If your goal is big enough, set sub deadlines. You may set a 10 or 20 year goal and then break it down year by year. So a person says, well, what if you set a goal and you don't achieve your goal by the deadline? There. It's just a guesstimate that enables you to focus. We cannot live without deadlines. If for some reason you don't achieve your goal by the deadline, simply set a new deadline. Number seven is identify the obstacles you will have to overcome. With regard to obstacles, there's always something that stands between you and your goal. If there are no obstacles, it is not a goal. It's merely an activity. Now there's a very powerful principle called the principle of constraints. What it says is that there's always one limiting factor or constraint or bottleneck between you and your goal that sets the speed at which you achieve your goal. You know, the 80-20 rule applies to constraints. Average people always blame their problems on external circumstances. Top people look inside themselves. The things that are holding you back are usually the lack of a skill, the lack of a quality like self-discipline or the lack of a particular knowledge or skill. Only 20% of the reasons you are not achieving your goals are on the outside. So always start with yourself. Number eight is to identify the additional knowledge and skills that you'll need to achieve your goals. To achieve a goal that you've never achieved before, you will have to develop skills that you never had before. And here's the great breakthrough thought that changed my life. At the age of 23, all business skills are learnable. Ask yourself, what one skill, if I was absolutely excellent at it, would help me the most to achieve my goal? Well, one skill would have the greatest positive impact on your life. What one skill would help you the most to achieve your most important goals? You say, woohoo, if I was good at that, I'd save myself years of hard work. People say, geez, it'll take me a week, a month, a year, two years to learn that skill. Life has always been hard. Life will always be hard. Life will always be hard. Only no hopers and thumb suckers and people with no future expect things to be easy. To accomplish great things, you have to work hard. Number nine, make a plan. Make a list of everything you'll have to do and then organize the list. First of all, by sequence. And once you have a list organized by sequence and priority, you have a plan. Once you have the goal and the plan, the very act of completing them programs them into your subconscious mind. People with goals and plans accomplish 10 times as much as people without goals and plans. A thousand percent more than people without. So write down what you want, make it clear so the universe can help you get it. Number 10, visualize. The most powerful faculty you have is the ability to imagine your goal as already created. See your goal as a reality every day. Your job is to give to the universe an absolutely crystal clear picture of the goal that you want, which you can only get by thinking it through and writing it down. Number 11 is back your goals and plans of persistence and determination. 95% of the goals that you will set for yourself in life you will attain as long as you persist, as long as you become unstoppable. The primary reason why people don't attain their goals is, first of all, they don't have them. And second of all, they stop. Your persistence is your measure of your belief in yourself. It's the way of your time. You persist, your belief intensifies.
When your belief intensifies, your desire intensifies, your desire intensifies. When your desire intensifies, your motivation intensifies, which makes you even more driven to persist in the attainment of your goals. Every act of persistence strengthens you and increases your ability to persist even more. Everything you do builds habits of success that lock in deeper and deeper and which ultimately guarantee your success. Remember, there are no real limits on what you can accomplish except for the limits that you place on yourself. There's a direct relationship between the level of clarity you have about who you are and what you want and virtually everything you accomplish in life. Average people just throw themselves at life like a dog chasing a passing car and wonder why they never seem to catch anything or keep anything worthwhile. For your desire to be intense enough, your goals must be purely personal. They must be goals that you choose for yourself rather than goals that someone else wants for you or that you want to achieve to please someone in your life. In goal setting, for the process to be effective, you must be perfectly selfish about what it is that you really, really want for yourself. This simply means that in setting goals for your life, you start with yourself and work forward. One of the most important questions in goal setting is this. What do I really want to do with my life? When you begin, these will often feel a bit like fantasies detached from reality. However, now your job is to make them concrete, like designing a dream house on paper. You start with your general goals and then move to more specific goals. Many people make the mistake of overcomplicating goals and problems, but the more complicated the solution, the less likely it is to ever be implemented, and the longer the time it will take to get any results. Your aim should be to simplify the solution to go directly to the goal as quickly as possible. For example, many people tell me they would like to double their incomes. If they are in sales, I ask them, what is the fastest and most direct way to double your income? So after they've come up with a series of suggestions, I give them what I consider to be the best answer. Double the amount of time that you spend face to face with qualified prospects. If you don't upgrade your skills or change anything else about what you are doing, but you double the number of minutes that you spend face to face with prospects each day, you will probably double your sales and double your income. According to studies that go back as far as 1928, the average salesperson today spends 90 minutes each day face to face with prospects. They organize their days efficiently to assure that they spend more minutes in the presence of people who can and will buy their products or services. 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of the value of all the things you do. In my advanced coaching programs, we teach our clients to identify those 20% of activities that contribute the most value and then do twice as many of them. Some of our clients double their productivity and subsequently their income in as little as 30 days with this approach, even if they've been working for many years in the same position. Always look for the simplest and most direct way to get from where you are to where you want to go. Look for the solution that has the fewest number of steps and most of all take action. Get going, get busy, develop a sense of urgency. The best ideas in the world are of no value until they're implemented. In determining your true goals, use the magic wand technique. Imagine that you have a magic wand that you can wave over a particular area of your life. When you wave this magic wand, your wishes come true. The magic wand technique is fun on the one hand, but quite revealing on the other. Whenever you imagine that you have a magic wand, your true goals in that area emerge. Here's another goal. Setting question that reflects your true values. If you learned today that you only had six months left to live, how would you spend your last six months on Earth? Who would you spend the time with? Where would you go? What would you strive to complete? What would you do more of or less of? When you ask yourself this question, what comes to the top of your mind will be a reflection of your true values. Your answer would almost always include the most important people in your life. Very few people in this situation would say, well, I'd like to get back to the office and return a few phone calls. In setting your true goals as an extension of imagining that you have no limitations, make up a dream list. If you have no limitations at all, Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, recommends that you sit down with a pad of paper and make a list of at least 100 goals that you want to accomplish in your lifetime. Then imagine that you have all the time, all the money, all the friends, all the abilities, and all the resources necessary to achieve these goals. 
The amazing discovery you will make is that within 30 days after writing out this list of 100 dreams, remarkable things will begin to happen in your life and your goals will start to be achieved at a rate that you cannot even imagine today. Here's another goal. Setting question. If you want a million dollars tomorrow, cash tax, free, how would you change your life? The primary reason that we stay in situations that are not the best for us is because we fear change. But when you imagine that you have all the money that you'll ever need to do or be whatever you want, your true goals often emerge. Here's another question to help you clarify your true goals. What have you always wanted to do but been afraid to attempt? When you look around your world and you look at other people who are doing things that you admire, what have you always wanted to do as well but you've been afraid of taking the chance? Have you ever wanted to start your own business? Have you wanted to run for public office? Have you wanted to embark on a new career? What have you always wanted to do but been afraid to attempt? In setting goals for your life long and short term, you should continually ask yourself, what do I most enjoy doing in each area of my life? For instance, if you could do just one thing all day long in your work, what would it be? If you could do any job or full-time activity all the time without paying, what would it be? What would it be? What sort of work or activity gives you the greatest joy and satisfaction? One of your aims in life is to enjoy as many peak experiences as possible. You achieve this by thinking back and identifying those moments of peak experience in your past, and then by imagining how you could repeat them in your present and future. What have been your happiest moments in life up to now? How could you have more of those moments in the future? What do you really love to do? You should have goals for social and community involvement and contribution as well. Think about what kind of a difference you would like to make in your world. What organizations, causes, needs, or social problems would you like to work on or work in? What changes would you like to see in your world? Who is there who is less fortunate than you that you would like to help? If you are independently wealthy, what causes would you support? Most of all, what could you do today to begin making a difference in your world? Don't wait until some future date when everything will be ideal. Instead, start today, in some way. One of the most important areas of goal setting is your financial life. If you could earn and accumulate all the money you need, you could probably achieve most of your non-financial goals faster and easier than you can today, if your life were ideal. How much money would you like to earn each month, each month, each year? How much would you like to save and invest each month and year? How much would you like to be worth sometime in the future? What sort of estate would you like to accumulate by the time you retire? And when would you like that to be? Most people are hopelessly confused about their financial goals. But when you become absolutely clear about them for yourself, your ability to achieve them increases dramatically. When you are absolutely clear about what you want, you can then Think about your goals most of the time, and the more you think about them, the faster they will materialize in your life. This process of asking yourself questions about your goals in each part of your life begins to clarify your thinking and makes you a more focused and definite person. Now, here are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, write down your three most important goals in life right now. Second, if you want a million dollars cash tax, free tomorrow. What changes in your life will you make immediately? Third, if you could wave a magic wand over your life and have anything you wanted, what would you wish for? As Peter Drucker said, whenever you find something getting done, you find a monomaniac with a mission. Uh, the more you think about your major definite purpose and how to achieve it, the more you activate the law of attraction in your life. You begin to attract to you people, opportunities, ideas, and resources that help you to move more rapidly toward your goal and move your goal more rapidly towards your goal, more rapidly toward, yeah. When you have a major definite purpose that you think about, talk about and work on all the time, your outer world will reflect this like a mirror image. Any thought, plan or goal that you can clearly define in your conscious mind will immediately start to be brought into reality by your subconscious mind and your superconscious mind and your superconscious mind, as we will discuss later. Imagine that you decided that you wanted a red sports car. You write this down as a goal. You begin to think about and visualize a red sports car. 
This process sends the message to your reticular cortex that a red sports car is now important to you. This picture immediately goes up onto your middle radar screen. From that moment onward, you will start to notice red sports cars wherever you go. You'll even see them driving and turning corners several blocks away. You'll see them parked in driveways and in showrooms everywhere you go. Your world will seem to be full of red sports cars. If you decided to buy a motorcycle, you would start to see motorcycles everywhere. If you decided to take a trip to Hawaii, you would begin to notice posters, advertisements, brochures, and television specials with information on Hawaiian vacation. Whatever goal message you send to your reticular cortex activates your reticular activating system to make you alert to all possibilities, to make you alert to all possibilities, to make that goal a reality. You will see stories in newspapers and recognize books on the subject wherever you go. You will receive information and solicitations in the mail. You'll find yourself in conversations about earning and investing money. It will seem as though you are surrounded by ideas and information that can be helpful to you in achieving your financial goals. On the other hand, if you do not give clear instructions to your reticular cortex in your subconscious mind, you will go through life as though you were driving in a fog. You will be largely unaware of all these opportunities and possibilities around you. You will seldom see them or notice them. Wherever your attention goes, your life goes as well. When you decide upon a major definite purpose, you increase your level of attentiveness and become increasingly sensitive to anything in your environment that can help you to achieve that goal faster. Your major definite purpose can be defined as the one goal that is the most important to you at the moment. It must have the following characteristics. First, your major definite purpose must be something that you personally really, really want. Your desire for this goal must be so intense that the very idea of achieving your major definite purpose excites you and makes you happy. Second, your major definite purpose must be clear and specific. You must be able to define it in words. You must be able to write it down with such clarity that a child could read it and know exactly what it is you want and be able to determine whether or not you've achieved it. Third, your major definite purpose must be measurable and quantifiable. Rather than make a lot of money, it must be more like I earn $100,000 per year by a specific date. Fourth, your major definite purpose must be both believable and achievable. Your major definite purpose cannot be so big or so ridiculous that it's completely unattainable at the moment. I made this mistake once myself when I was younger. When I first started setting goals, I set an income goal that was 10 times what I had ever earned in my life. After many months and no progress at all, I realized that my goal was not helping me because it was so far beyond anything I had ever achieved. It had no motivating power. In my heart of hearts, although I wanted it, I really did not believe it was possible. And since I didn't believe it was possible, my subconscious mind rejected it, and my reticular cortex simply failed to function. Don't let this happen to you. Fifth, your major definite purpose should have a reasonable probability of success, perhaps 50-50, when you begin. If you've never achieved a major goal before, set a goal that has an 80 or even 90% probability of success. Make it easy on yourself, at least at the beginning. Later on, you can set huge goals with very small probabilities of success, and you will still be motivated to take the steps necessary to achieve them. But in the beginning, set goals that are believable, achievable, and which have a high probability of success so that you can be assured of winning right from the start. Everyone wants to be a millionaire or a multimillionaire or a multimillionaire. The only question is whether or not you are willing to do all the things necessary and invest all the years required to achieve that financial goal. If you are, there is virtually nothing that can stop you. Take out a sheet of paper and write down a list of 10 goals that you would like to accomplish in the foreseeable future. Write them down in the present tense as though you had already achieved these goals. For example, you would write, I weigh X number of pounds or I earn X number of dollars per year. After you've completed your list of 10 goals, go back over the list and ask yourself this question. What one goal on this list, if I were to accomplish it immediately, would have the greatest positive impact on my life? At the same time, whatever goal you choose, write it on a separate sheet of paper. Write down everything you can think of that you can do to achieve this goal 
and then take action on at least one item on your list. Write this goal on a 3x5 index card that you carry around with you and review it regularly. Think about this goal in the morning, noon, and night. Continually look for ways to achieve it and the only question you ask is how your selection of a major definite purpose and your decision to concentrate single-mindedly on that purpose. Overcoming all obstacles and difficulties until it is achieved will do more to change your life for the better than any other decision you ever made. Whatever your major definite purpose, write it down and begin working on it today. Now, here are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, answer the question, what one great thing would you dare to dream if you knew you could not fail? Second, make a list of 10 goals you would like to achieve in the months and years ahead in the present tense. Select the one goal from that list that would have the greatest positive impact on your life. And third, make a list of everything that you can think of to do that will move you toward your goal. Take action on at least one thing immediately. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. What you think becomes your reality. Earl Nightingale in his audio program The Strangest Secret says that you become who what you think about. Ralph Waldo Emerson summarized this idea more than a hundred years before by saying, a man becomes what he thinks about most of the time. The law of mind is extremely powerful and is in many ways a basic law for explaining many of the other laws that refer to mind action. The natural extension of the law of mind is the third law of success called the law of mental equivalency. This law says that your primary responsibility to yourself is to create a clear and accurate mental equivalent of what you wish to experience in each dimension of your external life. If you want to be happy, you need to clearly define for yourself and create the mental equivalent or picture of exactly what happiness means to you. If you wish to enjoy health and long life or happy relationships or financial prosperity, you need to create in your mind an exact detailed picture of what you desire. As a result of a whole series of other laws that I'll be discussing, this becomes the critical starting point that begins inevitably to lead you to the realization of your dreams and goals. The fourth law of success is called the law of correspondence. This law has been talked about for perhaps 4,000 years and it's one of the fundamental laws that explains human experience. It simply says that, as within, so without. It says that your outer life will tend to be a mirror image of your inner life. Your external world will tend to correspond almost exactly to what is going on inside both your conscious and subconscious minds. There are four major areas where you see the law of correspondence working all the time. The first is simply in your attitude. Whatever your attitude is, often before you even say anything, people will reflect it back to you in the way they talk to you and treat you. As within, so without. The second area where the law of correspondence is evident is in your relationships. Your relationships will almost perfectly mirror your attitude and your personality. If you're a good and happy person, you'll have good and happy relationships. As you become a more patient and tolerant and loving person, your relationships will reflect this almost immediately, very much as a mirror will do. The third area of correspondence that you see is in your health. Much of your health can be directly traced to specific attitudes that cause you to suffer from minor and major illnesses. The extensive work that's been done in the area of holistic medicine seems to suggest that there are corresponding attitudes of mind for most illnesses that you or I suffer, from the common cold and flu all the way up to the most serious illnesses that are often life-threatening. Whenever you're anxious or upset or unhappy for any reason, for any period of time, your body will begin to reflect those feelings. The entire basis of psychosomatic medicine is the conclusion that your mind, psycho, makes your body, soma, sick. What your mind harbors, your body eventually expresses. The fourth application of the law of correspondence 
is that your external world of material accomplishment will exactly correspond to your internal world of preparation. The more knowledge and skill you gain that helps you to be more effective in your work, the more you will be paid. You can't hope to acquire or achieve anything more on the outside until you've acquired it or achieved it on the inside. The law of correspondence reigns supreme. The fifth law of success is the law of belief, which says that whatever you believe with emotion becomes your reality. You always have a tendency to act in a manner consistent with your innermost beliefs and convictions. Your beliefs, in fact, act like a filter or a screen that edit out incoming information and only allows into your conscious awareness the things that you already decided are true about yourself and the world. William James of Harvard said, Belief creates the actual fact. In the Bible it says, Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. For example, if you absolutely believe that you are meant to be a great success in life and that no matter what happens, nothing can stop you from achieving the greatness that is yours, you'll act in a manner consistent with that belief and you'll eventually make it come true. If you doubt your ability to be successful for any reason, this negative belief will be demonstrated in your tendency to hold yourself back. The most important part of the law of belief is the necessity for you to question your own self-limiting beliefs. These are the beliefs that act like the brakes on your potential. These are the nagging doubts and fears that people have about themselves and their abilities that cause them to sell themselves short. When you have self-limiting beliefs, you have a tendency to settle for far less than you may be capable of. Self-limiting beliefs revolve around your ability to lose weight or quit smoking or earn a certain amount of money or be attractive to members of the opposite sex or develop new abilities that are more conducive to your success and happiness. One of the most important steps you can take toward achieving great success is for you to question these self-limiting beliefs. You might even ask others who know you well what self-limiting beliefs they seem to think that you have that may be holding you back. Remember, self-limiting beliefs are often used as excuses. A good way to test your self-limiting beliefs is to ask yourself whether anyone else with the limitations you perceive you have has nonetheless gone on to achieve success. You can also look at your own actions to decide what it is that you truly value. Remember, it's not what you say or hope or wish or intend that is a true expression of your values and beliefs. It's only what you do. Children are very aware of this and they ignore the advice of their parents when their parents say, do as I say, not as I do. The fact is, we all seem to know that a person's actions are the true reflection of their innermost convictions. There's a great deal of confusion and unhappiness in the world today because many people feel that if they say something emphatically enough or write about it, it means that they truly believe it. But this is false. You only truly believe what you do. Your actions do speak far more loudly than your words. For example, if you truly believe in the values of persistence and dedication, it will be evident in the things that you do every single day. If you truly believe in the values of honesty and integrity and self-discipline, you'll demonstrate these qualities in your every behavior. In fact, you can tell what a person values by looking at what they did in the past when the pressure was on. It's only when you're forced to make a choice that you know what it is you really value. For example, when you have to choose between family and work or between money and honesty, your true values come out. The wonderful and important thing about your values is that you can develop them in yourself by disciplining yourself to act consistent with them, even if you haven't yet made them a fixed part of your character. I'll explain this later in the program. The seventh law of success is the law of motivation, which says that everything you do is triggered by inner desires and urges and instincts, many of which may be at an unconscious level, and your attitudes and behaviors will be determined by your dominant motivations, by what you really want and need in life, not by what you think you want. This is an extension of the law of values, and it's very important for you to understand. There's a simple formula called the ABC formula of human motivation and human action. 
The ABC stands for antecedents, behavior, and consequences. The antecedents are the things that happen before the behavior. The behaviors are the things you do. The consequences are what happens as a result of your behavior. We know that psychologically only about 15% of your motivation comes from the antecedents from what you read or learn or are told to do or not do. However, about 85% of your motivation comes from your expectations, what you think will happen. It's your beliefs about the consequences, about the future, that causes you to behave in a certain way. The clearer you are about the consequences of your actions, and the more intensely you desire to enjoy the consequences that your behaviors may lead to, the more motivated you'll be. This is why it's so important to have absolute clarity with regard to your goals in each area of your life in order for you to be motivated to perform at your very best. An important point with regard to the ABC formula is that your behaviors are not guaranteed to achieve the consequences that you desire. But every behavior or action that you engage in will generate a consequence of some kind. One of the most important parts of understanding motivation and behavior is to realize that both actions and inactions have consequences. What you do as well as what you fail to do will have a consequence in your future and sometimes the consequences can be dramatic and long-lasting. A good exercise in success is for you to write out a description of the type of person that you'd like to be and the kind of life that you'd like to be living. The most powerful faculty that you have is your ability to think, your ability to understand. The more accurately you can think about who you are and what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it, the more effective and successful you will be. The eighth law of success is the law of subconscious activity and it has several applications. The first part of this law is that whatever thought or idea mixed with emotion you hold in your conscious mind will be accepted as a command by your subconscious mind. This means that whatever thought, idea or goal you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis you can have because your subconscious mind will go to work to organize all of your thoughts and actions to bring it into your reality. If you desire to earn or attain a certain amount of money, you just think about it continually, day and night, and you use every means possible to drive this desire or hope deep into your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind will begin committing more and more of its reserve capacity toward bringing that goal or desire into your life. The second part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, once you give it the proper commands, will trigger your reticular cortex and its function, the reticular activating system. Your reticular cortex is a small, finger-like part of your brain that alerts you to events and circumstances around you that are consistent with your dominant desires or concerns. For example, if you decided that you wanted to buy a red sports car, this desire would signal to your reticular cortex that red sports cars are now of paramount importance to you. From that moment on, you would see red sports cars everywhere, even a block away. You would become extremely alert and sensitive to red sports cars, as well as to the means of attaining one of them. If one of your goals is to achieve financial independence, and you imbue this goal with intense desire, your reticular cortex will cause you to be extremely sensitive to all kinds of opportunities around you that would help you to earn more money. You would hear and see things everywhere that you might have been unaware of completely in the absence of having established this goal and planted it in your subconscious mind. The third part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, which controls your autonomic nervous system and all of your muscles, nerves, actions and reactions, also controls your body language and your tone of voice. Professor Moravian of the University of California at Santa Barbara has concluded that when you communicate with others, fully 55% of the message you send is contained in your body language. 38% of the message you send is contained in your tone of voice. And only 7% of the message is contained in the actual words that you use.
and your body language and tone of voice is largely controlled by messages about yourself and your goals that you've sent to your subconscious mind as the result of the way you think and feel. For example, when you've had a success of any kind, you send a charge of emotional energy to your subconscious mind that tells it that you're a winner. For some time afterwards, you walk and talk and act and think like a winner. Your step will be brisker, your voice will be stronger, your eyes will be more focused, and your body language will signify this belief about yourself. Your subconscious mind will accept your predominant emotional thoughts and organize your entire body, voice, and tone to fit a pattern consistent with it. The ninth law of success is the law of expectations. It's often called the law of the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's one of the most powerful of all laws because of its simplicity and its predictability. This law simply says that whatever you expect, with confidence, will have a tendency to materialize in your life. You get not what you want, but what you expect with the greatest intensity. For this reason, an attitude of positive self-expectancy seems to go hand in hand with great success in every area of your life. The wonderful thing about the law of expectations is that you have the power to manufacture your own expectations. You can decide to expect only good things to happen to you. You can walk and talk and act as though you believe the entire world was conspiring to help you to achieve your goals. You can become what W. Clement Stone often referred to as an inverse paranoid. You can become convinced that the entire world is conspiring to do you good. The way that you apply the law of expectations is by confidently looking for the good in every person and every situation. When you have a temporary setback, you can look into the setback for the valuable lesson that it might contain. Instead of becoming upset, you can say to yourself something like, I believe in the perfect outcome of every situation in my life. This kind of affirmation causes you to approach everything you do with a more positive and open and optimistic attitude. The most powerful of all expectations are the expectations you have of yourself. You should approach everything you do with an attitude of calm, confident self-expectancy. You should expect to be successful more times than you're unsuccessful. Expect to win more times than you lose and expect to eventually achieve your goals if you carry on long enough. The tenth law of success, which applies to many other areas of life, is called the law of concentration. It says that whatever you concentrate on and think about repeatedly with emotion tends to become more and more a part of your inner and outer life. Some of the most important work in psychology shows that if you dwell upon qualities that you wish to develop, like courage and sincerity and persistence, you tend to actually build those qualities brick by brick into your character and personality. The law of concentration goes hand in hand with the law of subconscious activity, and it largely explains the person that you are today. Whatever you've concentrated on in the past and are concentrating on in the present, is having a major impact on your conduct and behavior. What you concentrate on largely determines the quality and quantity of the results that you get and the success that you enjoy. The eleventh law of success is the law of habit. It says that virtually everything that you do is automatic and unthinking. You are largely a creature of habit. It says that from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you have a tendency to follow the path of least resistance, and to do the things that you've become accustomed to doing in the past. You eat the same foods for breakfast, you brush your teeth with the same toothpaste, you take the same route to work, you greet people with the same words, you go to lunch at the same time, you work in the same way. Now, there's nothing wrong with establishing habits that enable you to simplify your life. In fact, your life becomes successful to the degree to which many of the things you once needed to concentrate on, such as driving a car, have become automatic and unthinking. When you make certain things habitual so they no longer require thought, your mind then becomes free to concentrate on other things that can be more helpful to you in achieving the things that you really want. There are several parts of the law of habit, and the first of these is that good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with. The second part is that bad habits are easy to form, but hard to live with. One of the hardest of all things to change 
are bad habits which are counterproductive to the goals that you want to achieve. It's therefore important for you to sit down and think through the habits that you have and analyze them carefully. You need to decide whether or not they are moving you towards your goals or away from them. Remember, one of the most important of all observations on success is that everything you do either moves you in one direction or moves you in the other. Nothing is neutral. Everything counts. If a habit isn't helpful, it is hurtful. If a habit is not leading you to success, it's probably leading you to failure. The way that you overcome bad habits is simply to override them by the development of new, more positive habits. For example, if you have a golf swing that's causing your balls to go into the rough, you can override that habitual swing by taking lessons and learning how to hit the ball differently. If you have a habit of getting up later than you should, you can override that habit by repeatedly getting up earlier until that new behavior becomes the habit that dominates your thinking and your actions. By practicing the law of concentration in conjunction with the law of habit and thinking continually about how you would be with a new habit or behavior, you drive this message into your subconscious mind and you eventually begin to behave in a manner consistent with the new habits you wish to form. This brings us to the twelfth law, one of the most important of all the laws of success, and that is the law of attraction. The law of attraction says that you are a living magnet and that you inevitably attract into your life the people, events and circumstances that harmonize with your dominant thoughts. This is why we say that whatever you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis, you can have. Whatever thought you hold clearly and mix with emotion begins setting up a force field of mental energy that begins drawing towards you the things that you need to achieve that goal. This law of attraction has been written about for hundreds if not thousands of years. It's contained in the old folk sayings, like attracts like, or like begets like. Or you've perhaps heard, birds of a feather flock together. My friend Mark Victor Hansen says that, whatever you want, wants you. These are all ways of saying that your mind is extremely powerful and that whatever you think, emotionalized, becomes a form of energy like a magnet that's attracting the events and circumstances you experience into your life. In music, the law of attraction is often referred to as the law of sympathetic resonance. It explains, for example, that if you have two pianos in a large room, and you hit the key of C on one of the pianos, and then walk across the room to the other piano, the C note or string on the second piano will be vibrating in perfect harmony or resonance with the C string on the first piano. One of the most common examples of this law is when you enter a room full of people and you almost invariably have a sympathetic resonance or attraction with someone else in the room. You'll have a tendency to gravitate toward a person with whom you are comfortable and compatible, and that person will have a tendency to gravitate towards you. Very often, two single people at a social gathering will have a level of sympathetic resonance that draws them toward each other and into conversation. By the same token, when you have a very clear goal or idea, you'll attend to attract people to you and be attracted to people who have ideas and information and resources that can help you to realize that goal. Another illustration of the law of attraction is its opposite, which is the law of repulsion. When you begin to become a particular kind of person, because of the way you change your thinking, you will find yourself attracted to people who are similar to you and you will also find yourself repelling and being repelled by people who don't think the way you do. This law explains why positive people tend to associate with other positive people and why negative people tend to associate with other negative people and why neither group finds the other group of very much interest. You can begin to fill your life with the kind of people that you respect and admire by simply becoming the kind of person in your thoughts that will attract them to you. The thirteenth law of success is the law of choice, which says that you are always free to choose the content of your conscious mind, but in so doing you are choosing every other part of your life. Your thoughts control your reality, and since no one else but you can think for you, the thoughts that you choose to harbor determine everything that happens in your life.
The wonderful thing about the law of choice is that it says that you have complete freedom to think and therefore to be anything that you intensely desire. The choice is always up to you. The law of choice also says that you are where you are and what you are because you have chosen to be there. If you're not happy with where you are and what you are, it's up to you to choose to be and do something else. The 14th law of success is the law of optimism, which simply says that a positive mental attitude goes hand in hand with success and happiness in virtually every dimension of life. The quality of optimism is the quality that makes you into a cheerful and pleasant person, a person that other people like and want to be around and help. The most successful men and women tend to be very likable people. The more optimistic you are, the happier you will be moment to moment, and the more things you'll be willing to attempt. The 15th law of success, the law of change, says simply that change is inevitable. The only constant we have in life is that of change. Everything is changing, even as you listen to this tape. But the wonderful thing about the law of change is that nothing is fixed either. All progress requires change and since change is happening in any case you can be and have and do anything you want by simply harnessing the forces of change and taking advantage of them. The law of change also says that your life can only get better when you get better but not until. It says that you can't remain the same and somehow improve. The law says that if you don't take advantage of change you will end up being the victim of change. Things will happen over which you have little or no control and you'll simply have to go along and adjust your actions and behaviors to whatever occurs. Now, let me tell you a story that is true in more cases than not. Once upon a time, there was a young man from an average home with an average education working at an average job and who had an average group of friends. Like most average young men, he was primarily interested in girls and sports and television. He liked to have a good time and he spent most of his money enjoying himself. He looked upon his job as a necessary evil that paid for his average lifestyle and, like most average people, he was going nowhere with his life. Then one day, something happened to him. Perhaps he read a book that woke him up or listened to an audio program or attended a motivational seminar. Whatever it was, he wasn't the same afterwards. He realized that he could choose to do and be something else. He applied the law of choice. By the law of change, he realized that his life could only improve if he began changing in a positive direction. Using the law of cause and effect, he made some decisions about what he wanted to accomplish and then began searching out the causes of the effects he desired. By the law of optimism, he was positive toward himself and his possibilities. He expected good things to happen, triggering the law of expectations. He went to work on his thinking and he began to dwell, the law of concentration, on his ideal lifestyle. By the law of subconscious activity, he began to walk and talk like the person he envisioned himself becoming. He also began noticing opportunities to advance himself that he hadn't seen before. As he changed his thinking, he triggered the law of mind and the law of mental equivalency and he created a clear picture of his goals. By the law of correspondence, his outer world began to reflect his new, improved inner world. His beliefs about himself began to change and by the law of attraction, people and resources began to appear to help him move toward his goal. As he concentrated on his desires, his values and motivations changed and he began developing the kind of habits that lead to success. In no time at all, by bringing his life into alignment and harmony with the laws of success, he began moving forward at a rate that surprised even him. And so can you. The laws of success are based on the foundation principle that in order for you to succeed, you must first decide what success means to you. You can then begin to apply these laws to your definition of success to bring it more rapidly into your reality. There's a special quality that stands out, one quality that all great leaders have in common. It is the quality of vision. Leaders have vision, non-leaders do not. What is it then that leaders think about most of the time? We call this leadership quality 
future orientation. Leaders think about the future and what they want to accomplish and where they want to arrive sometime down the road. Leaders think about what they want and what can be done to achieve it. The good news is that when you begin to think about your future as well, you begin to think like a leader and you will soon get the same results that leaders get. Just think, the further you think into the future, the better decisions you will make in the present to assure that that future becomes a reality. For example, if you save $100 per month from the age of 20 to the age of 65, and you invested that money in a mutual fund earning an average of 10% per annum over time, you would be worth more than $1,118,000 when you retire. In personal strategic planning, you should begin with a long-term view of your life as well. In the process of idealization, you create a five-year fantasy for yourself and begin thinking about what your life would look like in five years if it were perfect in every respect. The biggest single obstacle to setting goals is self-limiting beliefs. You may believe yourself to be inadequate or inferior in areas such as intelligence, ability, talent, creativity, personality, or something else. You set either no goals or low goals that are far below what you are truly capable of accomplishing. By combining idealization and future orientation, you cancel or neutralize this process of self-limitation. You imagine for the moment that you have no limitations at all. You imagine that you have all the time, all the talents, all the abilities that you could ever require to achieve any goal you could set for yourself. No matter where you are in life, men and women who had achieved only average results at work for many years, but who suddenly exploded into great success and accomplishment, every one of them began engaging in what he called blue sky thinking. In blue sky thinking, you imagine that all things are possible for you, like looking up into a clear blue sky with no limits. You project forward several years and imagine that your life were perfect in every respect sometime in the future. You then look back to where you are today and ask yourself this question. What would have to have happened for me to have created my perfect future? You then come back to where you are in the present in your own mind and you ask, what would have to happen from this point forward for me to achieve all my goals sometime in the future? When you practice idealization and future orientation, you don't settle for smaller goals or half successes. Instead, you dream big dreams and project yourself forward mentally as though you are one of the most powerful people in the universe. You decide what you really want before you come back to the present moment and deal with what is possible for you within your current situation. Imagine that your work life was perfect five years from now. Answer these questions. First, what would it look like? Second, what would you be doing? Third, where would you be doing it? Fourth, if your work life was perfect, who would you be working with? What level of responsibility would you have? Fifth, what kinds of skills and abilities would you have? Sixth, what kind of goals would you be accomplishing? And seventh, if your work life was perfect, what level of status or position would you have in your field? When you answer these questions, imagine that you have no limits. Imagine that everything is possible for you. Now, idealize your perfect financial life sometime in the future. Ask these questions. First, how much do you want to be earning five years from today? Second, what sort of lifestyle do you want to have? What kind of home do you want to live in? Third, what kind of a car do you want to drive if your financial life was perfect? Fourth, what kind of material luxuries do you want to provide for yourself and your family? Fifth, how much do you want to have in the bank five years from now? Sixth, how much do you want to be saving and investing each month and each year, both in solid amounts and percentages? And seventh, how much do you want to be worth when you retire? Imagine that you have a magic slate. You can write down anything you want. You can erase anything that may have happened in the past 
and create whatever picture you desire. Now imagine your perfect family life. Look at your family and relationships today and project five years into the future. First, if your family life were perfect five years from now, what would it look like? Second, who would you be with? Who would you no longer be with or have in your life? Third question, if your family life were perfect, where and how would you be living? Fourth, what kind of living standards would you have or a lifestyle would you be enjoying? And fifth, what kind of relationships would you have with the most important people in your life five years from now if everything were perfect in every respect? When you fantasize and imagine your perfect future, the only question you ask is, how? Unsuccessful people always wonder whether or not a particular goal is possible. High achievers, on the other hand, only ask the question, how? They then set to work to find ways to make their visions and goals into realities. Review your levels of health and fitness in every area as well. Project ahead five years and ask yourself these questions. If you were a perfect physical specimen five years from now, how would you look, feel, and appear? Second, what would be your ideal weight? Third, how much would you be exercising each week and each day? Fourth, what would be your overall level of health and fitness? And fifth, what changes would you have to make starting today in your diet, exercise routines, and health habits to enjoy superb physical health sometime in the future. You then imagine that you are an important and influential person, a player in your community. If your social and community status and involvement were ideal, here are some questions. First, what would you be doing? Second, what organizations would you be working with or contributing to? And third, what are the causes that you strongly believe in and support and how could you become more involved in those areas? The primary difference between high achievers and low achievers in all of these areas is action orientation. Men and women who accomplish tremendous things in life are intensely action oriented. They are moving all the time. They are always busy. If they have an idea, they take action on it immediately. On the other hand, low achievers and non-achievers are full of good intentions but they always have an excuse for not taking action today. It's well said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Examine yourself in terms of your personal inventory of skills, knowledge, talents, education, and ability. If you are developed to the highest level possible for you, and there's virtually no limit to which you can become developed, answer these questions. Very. What additional knowledge and skills would you have acquired five years from now if your life was ideal in every respect? Second, in what areas would you be recognized as absolutely excellent in what you do? And third, what would you be doing each day in order to develop the knowledge and skills you need to be one of the top performers in your field sometime in the future? Once you've answered these questions, the only question you ask now is, how? How do you attain the skills and expertise you will require to lead your field in the years ahead? Especially, decide how you would like to live, day in and day out, your ideal lifestyle. Design your perfect calendar from January 1st to December 31st. Here are some questions for you. First. What would you like to do on your weekends and vacations if you could do anything at all? Second, how much time would you like to take off each week, each month, and each year? Third, where would you like to go if you could go anywhere and cost was no object? And fourth, how would you organize your life if you had no limitations and complete control over your time? When you have clear, exciting goals and ideals, you will feel happier about yourself and your world. You'll be more positive and optimistic. You'll be more cheerful and enthusiastic. You will feel internally motivated to get up and get going every morning because every step you are taking will be moving you in the direction of something that's important to you. The future is going to be better than anything that may have happened in your past. And there are no limits. The clearer you can be about your long-term future, 
the more rapidly you will attract people and circumstances into your life to help make that future a reality. The greater clarity you have about who you are and what you want, the more you will achieve and the faster you will achieve it in every area of your life. Now, your subconscious mind will accept your predominant emotional thoughts and organize your entire body, voice and tone to fit a pattern consistent with it. The ninth law of success is the law of expectations. It's often called the law of the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's one of the most powerful of all laws because of its simplicity and its predictability. This law simply says that whatever you expect with confidence will have a tendency to materialize in your life. You get not what you want, but what you expect with the greatest intensity. For this reason, an attitude of positive self-expectancy seems to go hand in hand with great success in every area of your life. The wonderful thing about the law of expectations is that you have the power to manufacture your own expectations. You can decide to expect only good things to happen to you. You can walk and talk and act as though you believe the entire world is conspiring to help you to achieve your goals. You can become what W. Clement Stone often referred to as an inverse paranoid. You can become convinced that the entire world is conspiring to do you good. The way that you apply the law of expectations is by confidently looking for the good in every person and every situation. When you have a temporary setback, you can look into the setback for the valuable lesson that it might contain. Instead of becoming upset, you can say to yourself something like, I believe in the perfect outcome of every situation in my life. This kind of affirmation causes you to approach everything you do with a more positive and open and optimistic attitude. The most powerful of all expectations are the expectations you have of yourself. You should approach everything you do with an attitude of calm, confident self-expectancy. You should expect to be successful more times than you're unsuccessful. Expect to win more times than you lose. And expect to eventually achieve your goals if you carry on long enough. The tenth law of success, which applies to many other areas of life, is called the law of concentration. It says that whatever you concentrate on and think about repeatedly with emotion, tends to become more and more a part of your inner and outer life. Some of the most important work in psychology shows that if you dwell upon qualities that you wish to develop, like courage and sincerity and persistence, you tend to actually build those qualities brick by brick into your character and personality. The law of concentration goes hand in hand with the law of subconscious activity, and it largely explains the person that you are today. Whatever you've concentrated on in the past and are concentrating on in the present is having a major impact on your conduct and behavior. What you concentrate on largely determines the quality and quantity of the results that you get and the success that you enjoy. The eleventh law of success is the law of habit. It says that virtually everything that you do is automatic and unthinking. You are largely a creature of habit. It says that from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you have a tendency to follow the path of least resistance and to do the things that you become accustomed to doing in the past. You eat the same foods for breakfast, you brush your teeth with the same toothpaste, you take the same route to work, you greet people with the same words, you go to lunch at the same time, you work in the same way. Now, there's nothing wrong with establishing habits that enable you to simplify your life. In fact, your life becomes successful to the degree to which many of the things you once needed to concentrate on, such as driving a car, have become automatic and unthinking. When you make certain things habitual so they no longer require thought, your mind then becomes free to concentrate on other things that can be more helpful to you in achieving the things that you really want. There are several parts of a law of habit, and the first of these is that good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with. The second part is that bad habits are easy to form but hard to live with. One of the hardest of all things to change are bad habits which are counterproductive to the goals that you want to achieve. It's therefore important for you to sit down and think through the habits that you have and analyze them carefully. You need to decide whether or not they are moving you towards your goals or away from them. 
Remember, one of the most important of all observations on success is that everything you do either moves you in one direction or moves you in the other. Nothing is neutral. Everything counts. If a habit isn't helpful, it is hurtful. If a habit is not leading you to success, it's probably leading you to failure. The way that you overcome bad habits is simply to override them by the development of new, more positive habits. For example, if you have a golf swing that's causing your balls to go into the rough, you can override that habitual swing by taking lessons and learning how to hit the ball differently. If you had a habit of getting up later than you should, you can override that habit by repeatedly getting up earlier until that new behavior becomes the habit that dominates your thinking and your actions. By practicing the law of concentration in conjunction with the law of habit and thinking continually about how you would be with a new habit or behavior, you drive this message into your subconscious mind and you eventually begin to behave in a manner consistent with the new habits you wish to form. This brings us to the twelfth law, one of the most important of all the laws of success, and that is the law of attraction. The law of attraction says that you are a living magnet and that you inevitably attract into your life the people, events and circumstances that harmonize with your dominant thoughts. This is why we say that whatever you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis, you can have. Whatever thought you hold clearly and mix with emotion begins setting up a force field of mental energy that begins drawing towards you the things that you need to achieve that goal. This law of attraction has been written about for hundreds if not thousands of years. It's contained in the old folk sayings, like attracts like, or like begets like. Or you've perhaps heard, birds of a feather flock together. My friend Mark Victor Hansen says that whatever you want, wants you. These are all ways of saying that your mind is extremely powerful and that whatever you think, emotionalized, becomes a form of energy like a magnet that's attracting the events and circumstances you experience into your life. In music, the law of attraction is often referred to as the law of sympathetic resonance. It explains, for example, that if you have two pianos in a large room and you hit the key of C on one of the pianos and then walk across the room to the other piano, the C note or string on the second piano will be vibrating in perfect harmony or resonance with the C string on the first piano. One of the most common examples of this law is when you enter a room full of people and you almost invariably have a sympathetic resonance or attraction with someone else in the room. You'll have a tendency to gravitate toward a person with whom you are comfortable and compatible and that person will have a tendency to gravitate towards you. Very often, two single people at a social gathering will have a level of sympathetic resonance that draws them toward each other and into conversation. By the same token, when you have a very clear goal or idea, you'll attend to attract people to you and be attracted to people who have ideas and information and resources that can help you to realize that goal. Another illustration of the law of attraction is its opposite, which is the law of repulsion. When you begin to become a particular kind of person, because of the way you change your thinking, you will find yourself attracted to people who are similar to you and you will also find yourself repelling and being repelled by people who don't think the way you do. This law explains why positive people tend to associate with other positive people and why negative people tend to associate with other negative people and why neither group finds the other group of very much interest. You can begin to fill your life with the kind of people that you respect and admire by simply becoming the kind of person in your thoughts that will attract them to you. The thirteenth law of success is the law of choice, which says that you are always free to choose the content of your conscious mind, but in so doing you are choosing every other part of your life. Your thoughts control your reality, and since no one else but you can think for you, the thoughts that you choose to harbor determine everything that happens in your life. The wonderful thing about the law of choice is that it says that you have complete freedom to think and therefore to be anything that you intensely desire. The choice is always up to you. 
The law of choice also says that you are where you are and what you are because you have chosen to be there. If you're not happy with where you are and what you are, it's up to you to choose to be and do something else. The 14th law of success is the law of optimism, which simply says that a positive mental attitude goes hand in hand with success and happiness in virtually every dimension of life. The quality of optimism is the quality that makes you into a cheerful and pleasant person, a person that other people like and want to be around and help. The most successful men and women tend to be very likable people. The more optimistic you are, the happier you will be moment to moment and the more things you'll be willing to attempt. The 15th law of success, the law of change, says simply that change is inevitable. The only constant we have in life is that of change. Everything is changing even as you listen to this tape. But the wonderful thing about the law of change is that nothing is fixed either. All progress requires change and since change is happening in any case, you can be and have and do anything you want by simply harnessing the forces of change and taking advantage of them. The law of change also says that your life can only get better when you get better, but not until. It says that you can't remain the same and somehow improve. The law says that if you don't take advantage of change, you will end up being the victim of change. Things will happen over which you have little or no control, and you'll simply have to go along and adjust your actions and behaviors to whatever occurs. Now, let me tell you a story that is true in more cases than not. Once upon a time, there was a young man from an average home with an average education working at an average job and who had an average group of friends. Like most average young men, he was primarily interested in girls and sports and television. He liked to have a good time and he spent most of his money enjoying himself. He looked upon his job as a necessary evil that paid for his average lifestyle and, like most average people, he was going nowhere with his life. Then one day, something happened to him. Perhaps he read a book that woke him up or listened to an audio program or attended a motivational seminar. Whatever it was, he wasn't the same afterwards. He realized that he could choose to do and be something else. He applied the law of choice. By the law of change, he realized that his life could only improve if he began changing in a positive direction. Using the law of cause and effect, he made some decisions about what he wanted to accomplish and then began searching out the causes of the effects he desired. By the law of optimism, he was positive toward himself and his possibilities. He expected good things to happen, triggering the law of expectations. He went to work on his thinking and he began to dwell, the law of concentration, on his ideal lifestyle. By the law of subconscious activity, he began to walk and talk like the person he envisioned himself becoming. He also began noticing opportunities to advance himself that he hadn't seen before. As he changed his thinking, he triggered the law of mind and the law of mental equivalency and he created a clear picture of his goals. By the law of correspondence, his outer world began to reflect his new, improved inner world. His beliefs about himself began to change and by the law of attraction, people and resources began to appear to help him move toward his goal. As he concentrated on his desires, his values and motivations changed and he began developing the kind of habits that lead to success. In no time at all, by bringing his life into alignment and harmony with the laws of success, he began moving forward at a rate that surprised even him. And so can you. The laws of success are based on the foundation principle that in order for you to succeed, you must first decide what success means to you. You can then begin to apply these laws to your definition of success to bring it more rapidly into your reality.